Those lights are a little intense. Can, can you dim down those lights a little bit, please, somebody? All right. I'm coming up here then. <laughs> ah, there we go. That's not too bad. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. I have a few friends here that normally don't come to church here, and I thank you for being here. It's such a blessing that you're here. I have a student from uh, the 90s. I think it was 94 when Alex graduated. He was on my gymnastics team and a artist of mine. And um, I was so blessed to mentor him uh, all those years. And now he has uh, told me he's a grandfather, so I really feel old. <laughs> and my good friend and mentor, Ryan Benchmer, is here with his boys. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. If there's any other student out there that I don't see, let me know. Raise your hand. I, I'm not sure. So let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer first, please. Holy Spirit, come fill this place with your presence. I pray that you would touch every heart in here today, that you would use this message to uh, help us take a risk in our life, in our faith, and uh, take the next step that you have for us, because we all have a next step. So we just pray that you'd use this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so just a little introduction. I, I was a Christ, I've been a Christian for 46 years. I accepted Jesus Christ in 1971. I'm, uh, my family, I'm married to Mary for 29 years, my best friend. Uh, my son, Davis, t David, is 26 right now and has two grandchildren. Um, I mean, I have the two grandchildren. He's got the children. I don't have to come home to him every day, which has made grand being a grandparent just a riot. It's a lot of fun. I just like to spoil him. But anyway, um, I was at the beginning of this church plant when we were at Wood School before we got to the river. And I don't know, about 13 years, I'm not exactly sure. I retired from high school art teaching and, gymnast and gymnastics coaching. Currently, I am an elder uh, and a prayer group leader at this church, and I um, am pleased to do Kids Church Art Sunday at the beginning of each month. Um, current adventure, um, what I call my bucket list items. I've got many bucket list items, and one of them is climbing um, the Grand Slam in Colorado. Colorado has uh, got the highest, some of the highest mountains in the United States. There's seven different mountain ranges. There's 54 14,000-foot mountain ranges in the state of Colorado. And if you climb them all, it's called the Grand Slam. So back in 19, uh, 1980s, when I went up the first mountain, the, um, I realized that, oh my gosh, I've got to do this. Because I went up with uh, a mentor of mine, Jimmo Hanrahan, who did a Grand Slam, and I climbed a, what, what's considered a blue level mountain, which is uh, kind of an intermediate mountain uh, difficulty. Got to the top and I thought, boy, I got to do this because I just love climbing. I've, I've loved climbing ever since I was Eli's age. My little uh, grandson, Eli, climbs over everything. And uh, I, I was that way too. And we all have a gift or talent. Everybody in here has at least one gift or talent that uh, God has given you. He does not make junk. God makes, uh, God makes us uh, to, to thrive. God wants us to uh, have an abundant life. I, I, a lot of times I hear people and it, it doesn't sound like they think God wants them to have a wonderful life, but he does. And I hope that comes across in this talk. Uh, there's a guy named Steve Harvey. I don't know if any of you have seen his video, but he has a, a motivational video saying uh, that you have to jump to soar. How many of you have seen that video? Okay, uh, if you're going to soar, if you're going to, if you're going to fly, you have to jump out of the airplane, and there's going to be a moment where the chute doesn't open. Right? Yeah. Okay. That is, you know, where you take the risk, where you take a step into the unknown, and you don't know what's going to happen. 
That happens in every one of us at some place in our lives and we can choose to take the risk and take the jump and soar or we can cower back and sit there and do nothing and stay in the same place for years. There comes a time when we need to go ahead and soar and take a risk and jump. So, um, jump to soar. For me, the outdoors and adventure has been the bent and the uh, passion that God gave me, just put it in me to love the outdoors. For me, the outdoors is like my second Bible because I see truth when I'm in the outdoors. The leaves, when they're blowing in the wind, they don't lie to you. You know, there's nothing deceptive in, in, when you're out in nature. It's pure, it's honest, it's real. And God leaves his fingerprint on his creation. So, um, can I have slide one and two up. Okay, that's my buddy Ryan right here. He's my mentor. We all have mentors, and we all mentor somebody. And I think that's the way God wants it. When I, w I wanted to learn how to climb on ropes, I was going up and down Devil's Lake all the time, uh, freehanding, and I wanted to learn how to climb ropes, and Ryan introduced me into top roping in some wonderful ways, not just average top roping. We're at a glacier in Alaska right here, and he's lowering me down a crevasse. So I can depend on him to help me get out of my comfort zone. Um, and that's ice climbing. Then in, um, in uh, another time in Colorado, he uh, helped me climb a waterfall, a frozen waterfall. So I'm uh, indebted to you for that mentorship and the adventures we've taken together. Um, this one right here is, uh, shows you some of the exposure you can get out in Colorado when you're climbing 14ers. This is um, David and uh, Tyler acclimatizing on Mount Evans. When you're from the flatland, you have to acclimatize. You have to um, get ready for the altitude, or when you go up to 14,000 feet, you suffer altitude sickness. So when you get into Colorado, the first thing I like to do is drive right up to Mount Evans and sit there for two or three hours before I ever tackle a 14er. So that's them playing around you know, on Mount Evans, just uh, having fun and getting their system acclimatized. Psalm 22, 2 and 3. I, I mean, Psalm 23, 2 and 3. He makes me to lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And let's have the next slide up, please. This is um, Mount Harvard. This is some of the beauty. So some of the reasons you ask why people climb. Part of the reason I climb is because I love to be out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness in God's creation, in his beauty. And water, for some reason, to, for me, restores my soul. So this is a little lake up close to Mount Harvard on, on a hike I did with, uh, with uh, Zach Schnabel. Let's get the next uh, slides up there. This is some more water slides. This is the Arkansas River. This is a campsite where I'll just plop a tent and then we'll fish and the water is pure and clean and there's trout thriving in that, in that river. It's a beautiful river. Okay, the next one. This is a sunset on the same river. My, I put my base camp, my, my tent there, and then go off into the wilderness to climb. Show slide nine. The next slide. Oh, okay, did I miss one? Let's see. All right, uh, six through eight. Yeah, this is um, Red Cloud. This is on top of Red Cloud going towards sunshine. Top of a 14er. Okay, next one. And uh, not only uh, do I like to climb to be, restore my soul, but I also like the solitude in the mountains. Notice there's no crowds up there. You get to the top of a 14er, you don't, you don't see anything. You take 360 degrees. As far as you can see, all there is is mountains, sky, clouds, as far as you can see. You feel like a little ant. It puts into perspective just how amazing our Creator is 
that has made these mountains, and that's only one mountain in one range. There's seven ranges, and there's mountains all over the Rockies. So, uh, Romans um, 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God reveals himself through his creation, even though he's invisible to us. We see his presence in his, his creation. Think about this fall. The leaves have changed. We're changing. He didn't have to make them colorful. He did. That's the God that we have. And when you wander out in the wilderness, if you take a moment any day, he's got something for you. God has something exactly for you that he wants to delight you with. He wants to make you happy. He's given you your backyard. There's glorious things happening there. Sometimes we've got to unplug. Part of the, the reason we're fasting is to unplug a little bit and to uh, spend some time with him so he can bless us. All right, slide 10. So, I'm going from Gray's to Tories. I had my, is there a slide before that that's got the tent on it? All right, that tent was uh, Ryan Benchmer's father's tent that I bought off of him years ago. And that tent's been to Alaska, it's been all over the mountains. I hope I'm doing honor to his tent, Ryan. But I'd, I'd take this little tent and i plunk it up. That's probably about 12,000 feet there. So I'm sleeping the night before. I, you can kind of see a little rainbow there, right? Okay, it rained that night, and um, I was ready to do the summit the next night. So what I like to do when I'm in solitude by myself and when I'm climbing with other people is I like to invite God to come with me on my adventures. So I pray, and I ask him to come with me, and he does. He comes with me. And my prayer warriors pray for me before I go to Colorado. I could not do any of these things all by myself. I've had mentors to help me, and I've had my prayer warriors covering my back. Because you don't go up these 14ers if the weather says no. You don't climb a 14er if the weather's wrong. If you're hurt, if you're sick, you can't do these things. And you, uh, these, this is not something you just decide to skip up and, oh, I'll do a 14er. There's a lot going on here, but uh, next, next one, the next morning, um, there had been rain, a little rain that night, and every rock, and this slide doesn't do it justice at all, but every rock was covered with a little glint of light from the sunrise. So it looked like I was walking through gold as I was, as I was hiking towards the next mountain. And it was so beautiful that I, I, I was just taken by it. And so I was enjoying the physical beauty. But then God, we walked together and he transformed me into a spiritual realm for a while. I don't know if you've ever had that experience in nature or anywhere. But he took me into the spirit realm and I was there for a while just in the spirit realm with God. So that should answer a question of why I climb one of the reasons I climb. One of my life... Everest is uh, in another country and... Yeah, 30... I don't know, what is Everest? 29,000? 29, 29,000 and change. Everest is a totally different, another league. Yeah. Yeah, 29er, yeah. It's the highest. Yeah. All right, so um, one of my life verses is John 10.10, 10. okay? The thief come, uh, does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I want to kind of give you some uh, incentive to start reading the Bible more because this verse is just loaded. There's so much in this verse. I'm just going to dissect it just a little bit. The thief comes not except to kill, steal, and destroy. And most of us have had some very difficult circumstances in our life, haven't we? And, and that's the enemy. A lot of people think, oh, that's God just doing that to me. But usually it's the enemy. The enemy is coming to steal your joy. He's coming to take away your, um, your peace. 
But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I looked at that for a while and, and I said, okay, how can we get to our joy? How can we get our joy back? How can we get our life back? And the word of God is a sword. In uh, James 4, 7 and 8, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's a promise. We can draw near to God when the enemy is attacking us. We can resist the devil. We have the authority to resist him. If you're struggling with something today, you have the authority to tell him to leave you alone and get out of your life. You have that kind of authority. He's given it to you in the form of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. So I want to encourage you to do that. You don't have to settle for being under attack or, or living less than everything God has for you. I want to... Um, tell you that the, uh, for some of you I'm not sure how much you read the Bible but the New Testament's written in Greek so I want to go to the Greek word zoe zoe the Greek word for zoe is life and I just want to quickly uh, run through the meaning of life because if you just took a surface look at um, you know I have come that they might have life you might miss what life actually means in the Greek in the Greek, it says, the state of one who is possessed of vitality or is animate, every living soul, life of the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God and through him both to the hypostatic logos and to Christ in whom the logos put on human nature. Do you guys realize that the word of God is alive? Do you realize that it's actually a different kind of a book? and that Jesus Christ is actually the Word, that he is actually alive in the Word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Think about that. When you're reading that Word, you're actually connecting with the God of the living God. Okay? The real and genuine a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed in the portion, portion even in this world. Those who put on uh, their trust in Christ, but after the resurrection, to be consummated by the new ascensions, among them a more perfect body, and to last forever. So, God is not only talking about life in the future when we get resurrected. When we get, get resurrected, we'll all have bodies where we can skip and jump over the mountains. We'll be, have our glorified body. But he's come to give us fullness of life now. He wants to give us abundance. A lot of people, I think, uh, think that, oh, well, you know, God will give me what I need so I can get by. He wants you to have abundance. And if you don't have abundance, you're missing something. You're missing the life that he died for. We need to ask for it. We need to claim his abundant life. And then the word abundantly. Exceeding some number or measure or rank or need over and above, more than is necessary, super added, exceeding abundantly, supremely, something further, more, much more than all, plainly, superior, extraordinary, surpassing, uncommon, preeminent, superiority, advantage, more eminent. This is from Strong's. This tells you what the Greek meanings of words are. So if you're struggling, if you've got a verse that all of a sudden hits you right between the eyes, go to the Greek. Find out what it means. And you don't have to go buy uh, any, anything other than get a free app nowadays to find uh, Strong's Concordance and find uh, New Testament Greek and Hebrew right on your phone or your computer. So that's right at our access. All right, let's go to uh, slide 11. All right, part of... Um, I couldn't keep this all to myself. So I like to mentor people. I like to bring young people up on these mountains too. There was this, uh, a, a boy that was struggling in his life, and I mentored him for a while at Fort McCoy. And um, his grandfather said, if you get through this, you, I'll, I'll give you uh, $5,000 or whatever if you get through this program, because he was right on the edge, man. And so uh, 
I took him up to Devil's Lake and we climbed around. He loved that. And he says, this is beautiful. I've never done this. And there's so many people around here. You know Devil's Lake is only like two hours from here. Some of you haven't ever been there. That's, there's adventures two hours from here. It's incredible. The Wisconsin River. Two hours from here and you're in the wilderness. But anyway, um, he said, you know what I'd like to do with that $5,000? I'd like to go to Colorado with you. And I said, well, if you graduate, you get through this, I'll take you. So we went up this uh, Mount Harbor together and summited. Right now, Zach's in the uh, Marines. He's married he's, and he's doing well. So there's a difference between vacations and adventures. Okay? A vacation is a nice memory. You take some pictures and you go home. An adventure marks you for the rest of your life. When you put yourself out of your comfort zone and you do something and then you do something with somebody else, together it bonds you and it, it, it's part of what your character becomes. It gives you courage. You know, when you're doing an adventure, you have to dig deep. You have to do stuff that's kind of scary sometimes and confront your fears. And when you do that and you get past that stuff, it builds your character. It develops you. So let's go on to the next one. This is my son, David. I've taken him up uh, two 14ers so far. Okay, next one. Uh, uh, that's a campsite on the gorge. Next one. This is fishing in the um, Arkansas River. So we'll fish right and have shore lunch right on the river. This is uh, next one. We'll just clean the fish right on the river. They're trout. You can't get fresher fish than that. Okay, next one. All right. Um, this is called top roping. And this is, David and I did this uh, where you're actually climbing a cliff. And when you're mountaineering, you're not, you're not climbing uh, like this the whole time. There are sections in, in difficult sections and sections where you do need rope, but most of it's just a long climb from dawn to dusk. Uh, sometimes it's eight to 12 hours to climb a 14er. Sometimes it happens over two or three days. And the 14ers are all ranked like ski hills, green, blue, black, double black. Um, and I realized that if I was going to do the Grand Slam, if this was really going to be a dream for me, I better start doing the double black ones while I'm still a youngster. <laughs> so Mary and I had this talk, and, and uh, we have a compromise. She understands that I have to do these, these adventures because I'm wired that way, and I, I come back a much better husband than if I'm sitting trapped in suburbia 365 days a year. That's just the way I'm wired. So she gives me the grace to go off into the wilderness for three weeks in the summer, summer fall, August through September. And let's get that slide up there. Next one. That's David and I summiting. This is an example of uh, the elk range, the beautiful elk range that uh, some uh, really difficult 14ers are in. Okay, next. This is a mentor of mine. Um, I to do this Pyramid Peak, this was the first black uh, level, level five, four or five, fourteener I did. So I hired a guide to make my wife feel a little bit better so, uh, so I wasn't going by myself. And that was fantastic because I learned volumes from this guy, guide. This is coming back down off of that fourteener. Look at the beauty that's out there. The, the, you know, you see these mountain goats. Uh, it's incredible, uh, the beauty that's out there. But he got me up there, and he also turned me on to a different way to climb. It's like a French Foreign Legion step that allowed me to cover way much more ground because I used to go up after 12,000 feet when you, the oxygen gets thin. <laughs> You're climbing like a hundred paces and then you've got to stop to catch your breath and wait for your heart to stop pounding before you can go inch your way up to the last 2,000 feet. But with this step and with these shoes that he turned me onto, it really helped me from, now, from then to now with the climbing I'm doing. And uh, let's get the verse up there, the next verse. Psalm 103.5. 
who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So I believe that if we, if we do our part of the promise, God does his part. And so I ask God to renew my youth. I ask him to renew my strength because I don't want to ever sit down and uh, get old in my spirit, in my mind. So I cooperate with it. I have, to do these 14ers, I have to run, I have to cross-country ski out here, I have to uh, mountain bike. So I'm in shape to do these. But I've found that he's answering that prayer and he's keeping me strong at 65. I'm still, I, I still got 23 more of these 14ers to go. I've done 31, but there's still 23 left. But praise God, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, next one. Let's go to the next one. Okay, and this is the arrangement I made with Mary when she heard I was going to climb the maroon bells. Well, she says, you're not doing that by yourself. So uh, she called Marilee DeVries. Some of you remember Marilee DeVries, okay? She lives in Colorado, and she has a friend named Dave Betts. Dave Betts is uh, a climber. So we hooked up, and Dave Betts was going to help me climb um, the Maroon Bells, which is one of the deadly, uh, very difficult mountains. So I got to his house, and I said, well, Dave, you've already done uh, the Maroon Bells. Why don't we do something different? And talking to Jimmo, that other mentor of mine, I asked him, okay, uh, what's the hardest 14er? Because i got to start knocking these off now. So he said, Little Bear in the Sangre de Cristo range. So I did Little Bear, me and Dave did Little Bear in the Sangre de Cristo range. And then that's me on top of Little Bear. Uh, that was one of the hardest 14ers to get there. But look behind me, you'll see um, a whole traverse. And then there's a mountain that looks a little higher. That's Blanca. There are four grand traverses in Colorado. And this traverse is ranked the hardest traverse in the state of Colorado. We got to the top of there and the weather was good and God surprised me and both Dave and we said we'll do, we're going to do that traverse. That traverse took three or six hours just to do the traverse to get to Blanca to bag another 14er and many places you'd have to go down crab walking or getting on all fours because there wasn't a way to just walk on a ledge without falling off the mountain. Okay, next one. Oh wait, no, back. Okay, so anyway, this tested me and um, I just want to throw this out there for those of you that like to do, uh, you know, kind of extreme things, but if you've ever um, done a gainer off a 40-foot cliff, um, that's a, a flip going backwards like this. That takes a certain amount of courage. You get your guts level up, and then you jump to soar, right? You do it, and then boom, hopefully you make it. And, and you make it in one piece. And so that's a certain amount of courage. It takes a certain amount of courage to jump out of an airplane, okay? Because the chute doesn't open right away. But when you're doing uh, this traverse, and that's one of the badass parts of this traverse, it's the, uh, imagine climbing across that. And you don't, it's just not just a one, you know, pump thing where you get your adrenaline up and go for it. Six hours, you're sustaining your guts level, and sometimes your panic is getting in there and going, oh, wait a second, I don't know if I can, I can do this. And, you have no choice. You're already halfway through the traverse. There's no, no change in your mind. You've got to dig deep. And you go to prayer. You go to prayer when you're sitting there struggling, when you're up against something like that. And so I dug deep. And, and Dave and I both said at the end of this, we would have never gone if the other guy wouldn't have gone with. And, and we helped each other. We worked through it. And so we... Um, that changed me, six hours of that. I felt great about doing it, and I realized that, okay, now you can do all of them. You did this one, now you're, it, it's possible to do all of them. So God blessed me with that surprise. Um, 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of, of a sound mind. When you became a Christian, when I became a Christian, 
or if you haven't yet, when you do become a Christian, you're given a new nature. Okay? A lot of us haven't really explored that new nature much at all, but you have a new nature, and do you know that you have, that new nature is not afraid? It's not timid. It's not fearful. It's got access to all the power of the universe at your fingertips. And we don't, we're not even understanding just five to seven percent of our potential. We're all sitting on this amazing potential that God's given us right inside our, our new nature. Let's go to uh, the next slide. This one was um, in, uh, let's see, where was it? That's a climatizing challenger on Mount Evans. It's a 13er. Okay, next one. That, uh, the next one, I, I did in snow. And this was a God thing. I want to explain how this went. Uh, this guy, this guy um, is Jim. His name's Jim. He's a search and rescue um, climber that I met up on a mountain. The night before I was ready to do the, um, this mountain, he calls me and, uh, from somewhere in Colorado and he says, John, uh, are you here in Colorado? I go, yeah. I, I go, what? He goes, what mountain are you thinking about doing? And I said, I, I'm thinking about doing Humboldt. He goes, oh, I was thinking about doing Humboldt. He goes, when are you thinking about doing it? I said, tomorrow. I said, I was thinking about doing it tomorrow. So that's an example of God's like supernatural intervention in answered prayer from my warriors. That would not have happened. That's not a coincidence. We climbed that thing together, and I asked my prayer people on, that, on this particular climb, which was last summer, would you pray for me? My knee's been bothering me. I have a cold. And so I climbed up with him, and he showed me a, a system for my knee where you put toe warmers on your knee, and you put, uh, um, it goes over, um, like your inner lining of pants and then you put the the top layer is like a, a an elastic bandage that worked for me to be able to climb the second hardest traverse okay next slide this right here was a defining moment that right here there is uh, we're at the base camp and and I've hired a guide for this we're I'm in the tent and I'm and my knees bothering me and I'm sitting there you know, thinking, I, I don't know if I can do this. I got a cold. And every excuse came to my mind not to do this, and everybody would have been fine with me not doing it. And I wrestled. I had a wrestling match. And this was part of where God met me here because he had not brought me that far with all these, you know, divine encounters to, to leave me not do this mountain. So I dug deep, and I, I went after it using the system that... Uh, Jim told me about for the, uh, my knee. And I w uh, let's go to slide 37. Okay, so the, in the morning, you're going up with a headlamp. And go ahead, next. And so this is a section of Crestone Needle to Crestone Peak. And um, next one. That's uh, where I'm roped in. That's one of the last sections. Okay, next. And that's on the top of Crestone with Will. Will has taught me volumes. Next year, I'm going to do uh, the Maroon Bells with him. And um, let's see. Where am I? Okay, let's go to the, the next slide. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so this is, um, you can also, you also do adventures with uh, your family. Mary and I do stuff together. We went to uh, Belize. We went scuba, dive, or scuba diving, snorkeling in Belize. We um, had a 40-foot uh, whale shark that came across. And, and right, we were right by a 40-foot whale shark. We were diving underwater. So we, do, we like to do adventures together. Okay, next one. She does adventures with my little granddaughter. There's adventures at every at level, at every age, that can be d done and undertaken. Okay. And here she is uh, with uh, Benchmers, and, and David is um, uh, belaying her up in Devil's Lake, uh, climbing, five years old, climbing the cliffs. Okay, next. 
This, and you do adventures with your friends. You hang around this church long enough, you're going to make some friends. I, I've, I'm so blessed to have friends that I actually like to do things with other than go to church. So you get in a small group, you start meeting people, and you go out and do things. So this is the Wisconsin River. This was two years ago on the Wisconsin ri River. Ed Davis and Tony, Daryl and Myra, and, and Mary and I, we were out on the Wisconsin River. We get up at sunrise, and the walleye run. God blesses us with walleye. So we were catching walleye on the Wisconsin River. On a sandbar, you know, overnight, two, three nights, we like to stay and, and take our canoes. And you could be in the middle of Canada. You know, it's like that. Uh, you know, and God gave us the weather. He gave us all this beauty and grandeur. Okay, next one. And then we had church. You can have church. It doesn't have to be in a building. We had church outside that morning. Daryl and I provided the music on our harmonicas, and then we just uh, shared, um, you know, a Bible study together right on, on the river. It was fantastic. We'll be doing that again. Um, Ed and Tony um, are back there. They're one of my good friends, and they will be hosting in February the a Love and Respect Conference. This is a little commercial for you guys. Love and Respect is coming up. It's a great marriage seminar. If you want to put the fire and the, and the health in your marriage again, I highly recommend you go to it. I've been to it. Um, uh, we've had just a lot of good success stories with uh, Love and Respect. All right, next one. All right, uh, I go to a, a, a three-day event called Trace Diaz. Trace Diaz, is, a lot of you have been to this. This might be new for some of you. But I want to explain this tripod. And if you have a pen with you, and if you have your bulletin, I'd like you to see if you can draw that. I, I'm an art teacher. I won't grade you too hard. See if you can draw a little oval. And on the legs, put piety, study, and action. As we're going through this, um, we're going to do a fast, a, a two-day fast starting today and ending on Tuesday. And on this fast, I gave you a long time here. How did that get up there? Oh, okay. Yeah, can we go back to the uh, piety slide just for a second? Um, this is a little memory jogger to help you figure out how to live a balanced, strong, and fruitful life in, in the spiritual realm. This is a risk I'm challenging you guys to do. Okay, to take this fast and go in and, and try to get alone with God sometime during the fast and see if you can uh, evaluate where you are at with piety, study, and action. Piety is a fancy word for worshiping God, for getting close to God, for learning how to develop a relationship with God. And you can do that by singing to Him, by praying with Him, the study part is getting into the living Word of God and starting to personalize it, start to read it. And then the action part is like just the natural outcome of getting piety and study into your life. Sit there and evaluate, where am I? Do I have all these legs of the tripod? Because if you're only on two legs, the stool is going to fall over. If you're only on one, if you're only sitting on action, if that's all you're doing and you're not studying, the word, if you're not praying, you're not going to be on stable ground and your life is not going to be abundant and fruitful for God because you're limping around. So you want to evaluate, where am I in this piety study action thing? Where, and then begin to draw closer to God. This is the next step series. Everybody in here has a next step. Everybody in here, and this is going to be a risk because sometimes, you know, when you first ask Jesus into your heart, uh, that was a risk, wasn't it? I mean, for most of us, to step off and jump into this unknown, and you didn't know what you were getting yourself into. But man, 45 years, I, I, I'm so grateful that I made that step. It's made all the difference of the quality of life I have now, not just my fire insurance for when I die. I have a quality, abundant life because I made that step 45 years ago. My life has been richly blessed. I want that for every member that comes here. I want you to be living. God wants that for you. 
He wants you to be living an abundant life. Not just a life that, oh, I got what I need. Oh, hum, I got... He, he's a, a generous God. He wants your life to be wonderful, abundant. Abundant, just like we read, Zoe. Abundant life. You can have that. I want you to take the risk this weekend to have that because our church is ready to take its next steps. We need to take our next steps. And we can. And it's going to take every single one of us. Just like a tribe of Indians. I like the Native American culture because everyone in the tribe was important. There's not one of you that's not important and significant in this church. We all need to link arms. We all need to join together. We're going to have a bunch of things that we're going to be doing in the very near future that's going to help plug you in. For those of you that are new and you need to be discipled and you need to find um, a Bible study to go to or a small group to plug in, we're going to try to get everybody hooked in somehow. And we need uh, the old guard to come out dust it off and get up and step forwards and teach a Bible study, okay? Lead something, okay? Get into this and say, I'm going to do my next step. I'm going to stretch a little bit. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to take a risk because, you know, this is risky. I don't, I'm not used to standing up in front of a congregation, but I've done enough risks in my life where I know God's going to come through for me, and I got all these prayer warriors. I had nothing to worry about, man. Christ is carrying me through this whole thing, and he'll carry you through whatever your next step is. I want you to think about, what is my next step? Ask the Holy Spirit. There comes a time where you need to start dialoguing with the Holy Spirit who lives in you. God's given each of us the Holy Spirit, and he's not too busy to answer a prayer like, where's my phone, where's my keys, Holy Spirit? Because he's assigned to you, man. He's right in you. The Holy Spirit's right in here. He wants you to talk to him and develop a relationship. Relationship is the piety part. Study the Word of God. Whatever your battle is, God's more powerful, and you can win every battle by getting into the Word. He's got a solution. He goes, well, people go, well, God never talks to me. He gave us the Bible. Open it. He gave us the Bible. You read the word, the answer's there. Talk to some of us. We should ha be mentoring somebody, and we should also be mentored. If you're not being mentored, maybe you're too proud, or maybe you're too busy. But you need to have a mentor in the spiritual realm. Just like I had mentors in, in the physical realm, we need mentors in the spiritual realm. So at this point, I'd like my son to come up and read about... Uh, what God considers a good fast. I think that's, this is David, my son David. Hello, hi. So, um, the reason we're doing this fast is uh, we're, we're all coming together to do this um, for the direction of our church. Um, and I'm doing it because I want to hear more clearly from God and I've done a um, couple day fasts in the past and We really need this as a congregation when we all come together and ask for his direction. He will show up and um, So I'm gonna read um, Out of Isaiah verse 58 uh, 6 It is not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke uh, to set oppressed free and break every yoke, it is not to share your food with the hungry and to provide poor wandering with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your he healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear, your rear guard. Uh, verse 10, and if you spend your... And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. 
Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will rise up like the old age foundations and you will be called repair of the broken walls, restorer of the streets with dwellings. So I'm just asking all of you, I'm doing it for the two days and I don't really like to do it but because I like to eat a lot, but we just had a Thanksgiving feast, so I think it's a good time now to start that. So um, with that, I'll get back to you. my dad. Thanks. Okay, one of the things that um, I do love about this church, we came into this church, and this, it was a shambles. It should have been torched and start from the foundation. We got problems with it. We got a roof problem. If any of you know any rich people, we, we could use a new roof. It's been leaking ever since we got here. That's part of the fast, but the big part of the fast is building the foundation of who we are as a church, who you are as a Christian, taking your next step, finding the Zoe life, abundant life. And then I want to read this Shalom because Shalom's from the Old Testament. Shalom means peace, but do you know Shalom's a lot deeper than that? The word shalom is deeper than that. Completeness, soundness, welfare, com uh, safety, um, friendships, tranquility, contentment of human relationships with God, especially in covenant relationship. Peace from war, peace uh, and health, good health. All that is contained in the word shalom. So I'm kind of trying to whet your appetite about getting into the Bible. Get into the Bible this next two days and start reading. And if you, if you got questions, ask the Holy Spirit. Ask, uh, you know, uh, another person in the church. Uh, and get into finding the meaning. Uh, you can go off for an hour on one word. I could go off on a way off on just what shalom, all, all that shalom encompasses. That's just one word from the Old Testament. So I just want to... Uh, leave you with a challenge. I want you to become part of our tribe. Uh, fast with us. Let's do this thing together. Let's, let's look for revival. Let's ask God for revival. Do you know when you fast and pray, that's got a lot of power to it? And when a church decides to fast and pray, that's even more powerful. We're going to have testimonies over, this, uh, over what happens this next two days hopefully for years to come. So I'm asking you to join us and, and uh, trans, help tr us transform this whole church and perhaps other people in the community, definitely other people in the community, because you know this is one of the churches that'll go out into the streets. Do you know that? We'll go out into the streets. We take in homeless people. We take in people exactly how they are when they walk through the door. I'm proud of that about this church. We help people get on their feet again, okay? It's Jesus who's doing it, but he's using a, us, frailed human beings, to do it through. But in our new nature, we're more than conquerors. In our new nature, we're princes and kings. In our new nature, we're children of the king. So I encourage you to join with us now and make this the best church we've, we've had to date. God loves you, and so do I. Mm. And to get started on your adventure, we have a rock climbing wall right behind the screen there. And uh, anybody, we'll start with the oldest first. Um, it goes up a good long distance. John, thank you. Thank you, dear friend. Well done. Well done indeed. I hate fasting, but I hate the devil winning in my life even more. If we're going to go to the next level, personally, we have to do something different than we already are. If we're going to go to the next level as a church, we have to do something different than we already are. And so, our first proclaimed fast begins. It begins now. We have handouts on um, why we're fasting, how to fast, helpful hints, scriptures like the one that David read, there's even a 200-page book by John Piper uh, 
incredible wise man of God that is free. You can just download it and read it off your computer and things. But it's not just giving up food. It's replacing it with the things of God. So the time that you would spend in food shopping, the time you spend cooking, the time you spend eating should be replaced with time with God in the Word. And there are scripture um, examples of things to look to take the adventure of this fast with a great attitude of saying, God, Jesus, you did this and you call us to do this and I'm going to do this with a decent attitude. That's what we're about. Dinner time can be the hardest. It can be the hardest. So Monday night during the dinner hour, 5.30 to 7, come. We'll have a Chinese spread right across the front here. All right, all of the delicious dishes that you won't even be thinking about. And we will together, together in this adventure, pray. And then Tuesday night from 6.30 to 7.30, just an hour. We'll worship our God. We will pray for and with each other. And we will break our fast with a small bowl of chicken noodle soup. It's a step. It's a step. And when we do this together, it makes it so much easier. The way that John benefited from those mentors to take John into new territory, so too with us and with this fasting. There are plenty of cautions if you need specific medication or whatever. Listen to the doctor, not to the pastor. All right? I never played a doctor in a play or anything, so listen to your doctor. All right? But do join us. I'd invite our communion ministers up at this time. Prayer study and action. Part of our action is very shortly the men's homeless shelter will be staying with us. Bob, why don't you wave your hands around there? He's got lots of openings for dinners, supplies. Um, for men to stay overnight with the guys. They are a blessing every time that they are here as well. Okay. Jesus fasted. He fasted 40 days before he began his public ministry. And the devil tempted him greatly. Tempted him with food. But Jesus responded that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. We're not simply discontinuing physical food. We are replacing it with spiritual food, aren't we? The principle of replacement. Jesus is the bread of life. Bread for sustenance, life like John shared about. Jesus, the bread of life. And Jesus, who was betrayed, who gave his life for us, he broke, his body was broken so that we might have life. as we partake in that, we remember your sacrifice and how you are the bread of life. And on his, the last night that Jesus was with his friends on earth before his suffering for our sake, he took wine and he gave thanks and praise to God. He said, this is the cup of the blood, which will be poured out for all of you. Remember me. Part of the Christian walk is the suffering 
It is part of that. But it pales in significance with the glory, with the life that God brings. So for communion this morning, I would invite everyone to come forward who said yes to Jesus. You don't need to be a member of the church here. Whoever has the bread will say, 